The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Theo Beers, and I'm a PhD student here at UChicago in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. I was asked to introduce tonight's talk with Peter Eichstedt. I should begin with a few programmatic and logistical comments. Um, this is the first World Beyond the Headlines event of the spring quarter. The World Beyond the Headlines is a project of the Center for International Studies. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and the Committee on Southern Asian Studies. We hope you will join us for the next World Beyond the Headlines event on April 15th, when Stefan Brunhuber will discuss money and sustainability, the missing link. Please see the Center for International Studies website for full details. Most World Beyond the Headlines events, including this evening's, are video recorded and are available for download on the CIS website. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Peter Eichstedt, a veteran journalist and author of at least five books of which I'm aware. He describes himself as being dedicated to revealing the stories behind human rights tragedies around the world. And to that end, he has done extensive work with a British-based nonprofit called the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, at one point serving as its Africa editor. Mr. Eichstedt's work with IWPR first took him to Afghanistan in 2004, at which time he helped to establish that country's first independent news agency called Pajwak. That is a substantial accomplishment on its own. Pajwak continues to be a highly respected organization, and I myself frequently read their reporting when I lived and worked in Afghanistan. Mr. Eichstedt returned to Afghanistan in the fall of 2010, and he spent about a year there interviewing Afghans from all walks of life, the result of which is this book, Above the Din of War. As you probably know from reading the advertising announcements for this event, Mr. Eichstedt's new book endeavors to tell us how Afghans from a variety of backgrounds feel about what is happening in their country today and what has taken place there over the past few decades. We already have a fairly large body of work, as the book jacket notes, that examines the Afghanistan conflict from the perspective of a foreign correspondent, political analyst, or US soldier. Above the Din of War gives us a more intimate approach, with many of the Afghan interviewees being humble individuals just trying to get on with their lives. I would point out that there have been Western journalists who have offered close portrayals of life in contemporary Afghanistan, such as Osna Seierstad's popular work, The Bookseller of Kabul. But Mr. Eichstedt's book still stands out since it manages to be both personal and broad. We see a variety of issues commented upon by a variety of individuals from, all places, from places all over Afghanistan. It is this fusion of the personal and the broad that I see as most distinctive about Mr. Eichstedt's book, although your interpretation might differ if you read it, as I hope you will. Finally, I've been reminded to inform you that copies of Above the Din of War will be available for sale after the talk. With that having been said, please assist me in welcoming Mr. Peter Eichstedt. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for that great introduction. I have to, I'll have to take some notes from that. When I, um, anyway, I appreciate it very much, and I appreciate you coming out on a night like this to talk about this kind of to um, kind of topic. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, quite often want to come out and talk about these kind of serious uh, issues. Um, we have been fighting a war in Afghanistan for 12 years now. It is the longest war in America's 237 years of existence. More than 2,200 American soldiers have lost their lives there, and many more have been wounded and maimed. Before it is all said and done, America will have spent about $4 trillion on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and their aftermath. I first went to Afghanistan in 2004 with an organization, like was mentioned earlier, called the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. I was part of a team of journalists that helped Afghans start the country's first independent news agency. I'm happy to report it's still alive, <clears throat> but like all such foreign aid programs, it probably won't survive much long after international forces leave in 2014. When I returned to Afghanistan in 2010, again with the Institute, the country had changed. All of the hope and enthusiasm that I had witnessed in 2004 was gone. New boulevards had been built, and much of the destruction of war had been removed. But Kabul felt like a city under siege. 
Concrete barriers and the national police man most intersections, vigilant for suicide bombers. Restaurants frequented by Westerners were protected by walls of sandbags. And for good reason. The Taliban strikes a will anywhere in the country. Suicide bombings are more prevalent and more destructive than ever. Neither Afghan nor US nor international forces are immune from these withering attacks carried out every day, every week, every month. It is a relentless pounding on the Afghan psyche. The people in Afghanistan are the most important part of the Afghan puzzle. But the story of how they've been affected for 12 years of war, how they have suffered, and how they see their future has been virtually ignored. Throughout my year of travel, I found that little has been done to improve the life of the average Afghan. For many, life is more deadly than ever. As the deadline for troop withdrawal nears, Afghans are faced with the decision of what to do when the Taliban returns to power. Far too many in Afghanistan, for far too many in Afghanistan, the Taliban is a daily part of their lives. In the southern Afghan, southern province of Helmand, I found that the Taliban had forced the country's telephone companies to restrict phone service to just six hours a day. This was so that international forces could not monitor their calls and track them down at night. Yet the government insisted it was in control, but it was clearly not. When I visited the nearby town of Marja, the site of a ferocious battle in early 2010, the Taliban was still in control of this poppy-growing region. The day I was there, almost a thousand Afghan and national police were battling the Taliban who were protecting that year's poppy harvest. Poppies, opium, and heroin are a major source of income for the Taliban. I also met a Taliban judge who dispensed uh, Taliban justice by chopping off fingers, hands, and arms for violations of Sharia law. The Taliban hanged anyone who collaborated with the international forces and who was considered a spy and a traitor to their cause. In the eastern city of Jalalabad, I drank tea with a video store owner whose shop had been bombed by fundamentalists. The shopkeepers were being accused of destroying Afghan and Muslim culture by selling Western music and movies. In the western city of Herat, I talked with young girls on their deathbeds. They had doused themselves with kerosene and lit themselves on fire. It was their final cry of rage against their fate having been sold into marriages of servitude and abuse at the age of nine or 10. In the nation's juvenile prison in Kabul, I spoke with a boy who had been forced to become a suicide bomber or be killed. Instead, he had unstrapped his suicide vest, turned himself over to US forces and become an informant. And a woman in parliament from the western city of Herat told me how she and her staff, or part of her staff, had been executed by the Taliban as they campaigned in the countryside. The woman was then threatened over the phone and forced to withdraw from the election. When she went to the police for help, she was accused of arranging the killings herself. A former Afghan warlord insisted that the Afghan people had been misled by the international community. He said life in Afghanistan was less dangerous under the former Soviet Union occupation. He predicted the return, that the return of the Taliban was a certainty. And just as certain is a return to civil war. As you can see, life in Afghanistan is as difficult as it has ever been. Most Afghans have a very different view of the Afghan war and the future than that of the generals and the diplomats and President Karzai. These are all the people who are most often quoted in news media and yet have a vested interest in perpetuating the idea of American success. The support of the Afghan people is critical to the success of Afghanistan, yet their attitudes and the effects of 12 years of war have gone largely unreported and their, vices, their advice has been ignored. 
when the US military inserts itself and takes control of an area, even with Afghan forces, that control simply disappears when the US forces withdraw and move on. And, expectedly, the Taliban returns and fills the void. The Taliban, in fact, controls about 75% of the countryside. And they have a shadow government in every province. They tell the Afghan people, they have the watches, but we have the time. Nothing could be more true. As the Taliban waits for our departure, they are limiting their losses while creating as much chaos as possible. As has already become evident in just the last few weeks, the suicide bombings and attacks will be bigger, more deadly, and more frequent. Afghans are painfully aware of what will happen when the US and NATO forces leave, and they are already preparing for civil war. As polls show, most Americans have no idea why we're still in Afghanistan and have less of an idea of who the Afghan people really are. That's why I wrote the book. I think that if Americans better understand the Afghan people, they will be outraged at what has happened and what has not happened. The lack of understanding is not just among the American public, though. Most Afghans saw America as the greatest hope for our future. It didn't happen. Now many Afghans see the US and NATO as the cause of their problems, not the solution. They rightly ask, if Americans can't defeat the Taliban, who can? After all, the Taliban are very poorly equipped, yet they fight effectively against the most powerful and most advanced army in the world. Afghans resent that America didn't deliver on its promise. Afghans admittedly have not resisted the resurgent Taliban in any meaningful way either. This tells us that ultimately peace in Afghanistan is in any country, cannot be imposed from the outside. It must come from the people themselves. So, what can be done with Afghanistan? <clears throat> the only hope for a graceful exit from Afghanistan is a peace agreement that involves the Taliban and its primary supporters, Pakistan and Iran. Without that, no deal will hold firm. To forestall the inevitable collapse of the Afghan House of Cards, an extended and U.S. international presence is necessary. Although this is very unlikely due to the paucity of support and the lack of political will. Given the ethnic divisions in Afghanistan, a workable peace deal also demands semi-autonomous regions controlled by the various former Afghan warlords who today are part and parcel of the Karzai government. These strongmen will undoubtedly carve up Afghan along Afghanistan along ethnic lines anyway in the event of a civil war. If America truly wants to finish the job it started, it must commit to rebuilding Afghanistan, not just making war. Such an attitude would be welcomed in Afghanistan. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to shift gears a little bit here um, and read <clears throat> a little bit uh, just a, a short brief section from my book, one of my interviews with uh, somebody I, I thought, I feel, had a very dramatic story to tell. And um, his story illustrates a lot about Afghanistan on a number of levels. Um, well, one, it's a compelling story, but two, it's, it also demonstrates the complexity of the situation there and the interconnectedness of society and the Taliban. I call it the prisoner of the Taliban. Safayullah Mujadadi lived in an ancient mud brick residence next to one of Herat's many mosques. In his mid 40s, he had a trim beard, a gentle demeanor, and the delicate hands of a respected Islamic scholar. 
It was a warm day when we met, and a cooling breeze billowed the curtains as he poured hot green tea. Before deciding to run for parliament, Mujadidi thought about it long and hard. Three months before registering myself, I, I sought the advice of my family, he said. They encouraged him to run, and they were confident he could win. After all, he was a man of intelligence and respect in the community. He would do well. I didn't feel it would be dangerous, he said. I'm a religious person. My family was not bad, but rather was one of the most respected. He considered hiring bodyguards, but he rejected that idea. He felt perfectly safe, and he was eager to hit the campaign trail. The campaign stop was supposed to be a routine, a meeting with village elders to hear their complaints and seek their advice. Mujadidi didn't expect any trouble, despite the fact that he saw some armed men at the periphery of the village when he arrived. I had been threatened many times, he said, but none of the threats had been carried out. The sight of men with AK-47s caused him no alarm. As Mujadidi entered the elder's tent and sat down to drink tea, he noticed that the tent was being surrounded. In the village was a man named Abdullah, the son of a local Taliban commander who had been killed by U.S. forces. Mujadidi had been advised to meet with Abdullah, whose family he had known for many years. Abdullah's father had been a friend, and Mujadidi had taught Abdullah's brother and sister. Mujadidi sent an aide to go find Abdullah and invite him to the meeting. Moments later, Mujadidi saw Abdullah leaving on a motorcycle. Two armed men then came to Mujadidi and said they were sent by Abdullah. They wanted Mujadidi to go to another village and settle a dispute. Mujadidi hesitated, saying he had the campaign. But Abdullah's men insisted. So Mujadidi relented. He drove his own car to the village, accompanied by several of his campaign staff and two of Abdullah's armed guards sitting in the open trunk. Mujadidi was told he had to visit, also visit a man known as Sheikh, an associate of Abdullah. As he arrived at the mouth of a small canyon, though, Mujadidi and his colleagues were ordered out of their car. Then, with guns at their backs, Mujadidi and his companions were prodded up in, into the canyon and up a mountainside. After five hours, they arrived at a Taliban encampment in a cave, exhausted, hungry, and thirsty. There they found Sheikh, one of the region's most notorious Taliban commanders. Despite obviously being a prisoner, Mujadidi asked, what kind of hospitality is this? Sheikh handed him a piece of paper explaining that the rules of the, new, the Taliban's new Islamic Republic, called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, under these rules, anyone who was part of the Garzai government had to be killed. Since Mujadidi was a candidate, he had to die. Sheikh told him to compose a farewell letter to his family. Instead, Mujadidi asked for time to pray. I told them that even in Guantanamo, you, have, you can pray. What kind of Islamic government do you have if a person can't pray? Mujadidi continued and tried to intimidate the Taliban fighters, banking on his status as an Islamic scholar. Fighters became defensive and told him to shut up. Don't bother us with such garbage, they said. You have cheated us, Mujadidi complained. We went to the village to solve people's problems. I should be killed because I'm a friend to people? Later, an older fighter named Fazl entered the cave. He was a rugged man with a dyed red beard, as was the custom among the elders. Faisal wanted Mujadidi beheaded, saying that it had been too many days without a killing and he wanted to wash his hands in blood that day. Faisal hated foreigners and the government because he had lost several of his own sons to attacks by international forces. He was a dangerous man, Mujadidi said. And he knew that to anger Fazl unnecessarily meant certain death. Then Fazl told Mujadidi, 
Since you're our friend, we haven't killed you for now. We are under this Islamic government and should follow orders. But I'm willing to change this order if you give us $200,000. Mujada D swallowed hard. I told him it was shameful and stammered that we can't come up with that kind of money. Neither he nor his family had that much. It's impossible, Mujadidi said, and then convinced the fighters to at least cut the demand in half, down to $100,000. It was still an outrageous amount. Mujadidi said, well, I can't make the phone call anyway because there's no phone signal in this cave. So Sheikh called for two horses and two guards, and they took Mujadidi up to a distant hill where he could get a weak phone signal. They warned him not to alert security forces. The only person to be contacted was his relative, Hazrat Shigbatullah Mujadidi, the head of the upper house of parliament, known as the House of Elders. Mujadidi contacted his relatives and returned to the cave where he spent a restless night under a thin wool blanket. The next morning, he again was taken to the spot where he could get the phone call we get phone reception and learned that his relatives had only been able to raise twenty thousand dollars. It was not enough, Sheikh said. The family had to come up with more money. Over the next several days, Mujadidi was repeatedly told he was going to be beheaded. With his hands bound, he was taken to a place near the cave and forced to his knees. He pleaded for his life and those of his friends. I asked them to let my friends go and just kill me. He alternately berated his captors, chastising them for acting contrary to the Quran. He warned them to take care of their souls because they had deceived him and treated him like a prisoner. He reminded them of the Afghan custom that once someone has tasted your salt, tasted their salt by sharing a meal, that person was to be treated as a guest. Instead of answering, they would put a gun to my head, Mujadidi said. During such a moment, Mujadidi noticed that the gunman had begun to cry. He couldn't pull the trigger. Mujadidi forgave the man, then lifted his eyes to heaven and offered a prayer. He said, I thank God for changing their hearts. Mujadidi and his colleagues were moved several times, spending just a couple of nights in each of several Taliban camps. They were forced to sit for hours on end, unable to move, even to relieve themselves. The fighters battered them with their rifle butts. They started to torture us, he said, and kept Mujadidi and his friends tied to one another so no one could escape. Then something changed. Mujadidi and his companions were suddenly taken to a village, the same village that Mujadidi had been asked to visit earlier. Sheikh informed him that a negotiator had arrived from Quetta, Pakistan to arrange their release. The negotiator was from the highest levels of the Taliban and was an emissary from the Quetta Shura, the Taliban ruling, ruling council. Mujadidi's elder relative, Shigbatullah Mujadidi, was not only the leader of the Afghan upper house of parliament, he was the chief negotiator between the Afghan government and the Taliban. The younger Mujadidi was worth more alive than dead. The Quetta Shura had issued orders that Mujadidi was not to be killed. Instead, he would be ransomed by the Taliban, who would pay Abdullah and Sheikh for their successful capture of this high-ranking man. Meanwhile, 18 Taliban prisoners were also supposed to be released by the Taliban government in exchange for Mujadidi and his colleagues. At first, Mujadidi was reluctant to believe he would actually be freed. He feared his hopes would be dashed. I didn't believe them. They had broken their oaths in the past. That evening, he was taken by motorcycle to another community where he and his Taliban escorts pulled up to a large tent and stopped to pray. Once the prayers were completed, his Taliban guards left. It was quiet. Mujadidi looked around. I took the opportunity to escape, he said and walked 200 yards to a nearby house where he saw some lights. Once inside, he called his family and said, I'm finally free. 
Abdullah and his men were not acting on their own, Mujahideen was convinced, but were acting on orders from the top Taliban leaders to disrupt the Afghan parliamentary elections as much as possible. The Taliban, in turn, were being supported and directed by Pakistan. Even in Western Afghanistan, I asked, where Iran has the most influence? Yes, he said, explaining that Iran has its own economic and political reasons to keep Afghanistan in turmoil and weak. Iran has resources to manipulate the Taliban and achieve those ends. Abdullah and his brothers fled to Iran, and they stayed there, Mujahideen told me. Will you return to politics after this ordeal? I asked. Why not? Inshallah, if God willing. We should never submit to these animals, he said. It would only increase their power. If we quit now, we can never get revenge on these people. Then Mujahideen's phone rang. It was the provincial governor asking him to come immediately. He rose, he said goodbye, and I watched as Mujahideen climbed into an unmarked four-wheel drive Toyota with two armed guards. As he disappeared around the corner, I felt somewhat better about the possibilities of Afghanistan. The conviction with which Mujahideen had said the Taliban needed to be resisted was reason for hope. Thank you. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Yes? You find that people were very reluctant to talk to you at because of the situation? Um, you know, it, it was ironic. I found very much the opposite. Um, like, for example, this guy I just talked about, this Mujadidi, there were a couple of other colleagues of his uh, who I had mentioned who had run for parliament and who had had relatives killed, um, bomb threats, they had been shot at. And uh, <laughs> one guy in particular, he'd, he'd, he and his family had been ambushed and had to fight their way, shoot their way out of an ambush. Um, and so uh, I asked him that question. I said, why are you telling me this story? And he, you know, he told me, he said, nobody even asked me. I'm happy you even care. And I said, are you kidding? I said, not even the police? He says, no. I said, well, you're a member of parliament. How can you police not investigate this? <laughs> I mean, it just, it just, I mean, he just shrugged. But I mean, it just told me that this, this facade of government there and government control is it's just non-existent. It's like a movie set. And I, I mean, I hate to say that, but, and I hate to be a talk, talk bad about the government, but I mean, that is the honest truth. It's like a movie set there. The government's there, you know, and the police, they're paid for by international forces. They're trained. They got vehicles. And what do they do? They just sit there. I, I mean, I, what can you say? Yes. Hmm. Now, you have suggested the solution that it is Iran and Pakistan who could manage this. Uh, how does Iran and Pakistan together think about this? Is there a conflict or interest between them, or would they, uh, would they help each other to manage the situation? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, that, that's a, a question that I had in my mind the entire time. I still have it in my mind. You know, exactly what does Pakistan and Iran expect to get out of all this turmoil there? And uh, it, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to find an answer. It's, hard, it's, hard, it's difficult for me to answer. I don't have an easy one. But what I do feel confident talking about or saying is that I think as much as anything, they are resisting Western control over Afghanistan. They don't necessarily have some major strategic effort. They simply don't want the West there. And once the West is quote unquote defeated, then they'll do what they want. I mean, a, a couple of other Afghans, uh, parliamentarians that I talked to about the same question, a number of, um, 
I said, well, why, you know, why is Pakistan so, so interested in controlling and, and supporting the Taliban? And um, they, the, the explanation I got, which I still have a hard time understanding, maybe you can know more about it, is that Pakistan is, still lives in mortal fear of India. Uh, it may not necessarily be just fear, but it's, it's antagonism. And they are afraid of Indian control or Indian influence in Pac Afghanistan, which is literally Pakistan's back door. And so that's why they're resisting. They see it as a defensive measure, not necessarily an offensive measure. So one of the things I talk about in my final chapter of my book is the... Uh, the mineral wealth that's been recently discovered in, um, here, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> um, the mineral wealth that's been discovered, like there's a, the copper mine that's just south, uh, southeast of uh, Kabul, is uh, considered to be, well, just from the sampling ore that's already been done, it'll be one of the world's largest copper deposits. So it's worth billions of dollars. And the Chinese got the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the rights to the lease to develop it. Uh, but there's also tremendous amounts of iron ore have been discovered there. And an Indian company has received uh, the majority of the leases for, for development of this. And they've made all these promises about um, building hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I specifically sat down and I asked the Minister of Mines in Afghanistan, I said, do you really expect the Indian companies to be able to come here and develop this? Uh, do you think Pakistan's gonna sit back given what's happened for the last 12 years? And he just, oh, it's not gonna be a problem. <laughs> He's like, are you kidding me? You, someone else had a question. You, go ahead. You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you. I want to get back to your story. Okay. okay. Material. I think it's. Uh, I think this um, Mujahideen story is very interesting because he's not just a guy, right? He's if he's related to Sifatul Rahman, who's Mujahideen. He's related to just about the most powerful person. Yeah. Afghanistan. It's not just by chance that he has a relative up there. So, so the story is more complex in many ways. He's not like another parliamentarian who could have been kidnapped and killed because. He was that other person wasn't worth. I mean, this guy he could have redeemed him for millions of dollars. Yeah. His relative, if he wanted to. So it's a way more. And I, I yeah, what I liked story. about this this story was that too was that he knew all the Taliban commanders. He knew their fathers. Oh, he, teacher, yeah. yeah, he had been their teacher. So it's not just a them and us kind of thing. Good guys and bad guys. It's a very complex situation, and that's, um, I, you know, it, it's still you know the the young Mujahideen was very angry about this whole thing and he was again like he was you know ecstatic that that I wanted to sit down and, and he told his story I mean we sat there for two hours you know I drank more tea in two hours and <laughs> but I mean it was just it was just fascinating I just sat there spellbound and filled up a whole notebook <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's, very, it's interesting because he's not just a guy yeah and then I, I later I, I interviewed the 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 elder uh, Mujahideen. Okay. He had some very very pointed comments too, about mostly about U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> but he was he was quite a man too. This elder, he's 85, 86 years old, just as sharp as a tack. Spoke a number of languages. He spoke English fluent, you know, flawlessly. And I, he was holding court when I interviewed him and. He was he was he was a fun interview too. So you had a question, right? Well, I'm just you say that Mujahideen gives you hope. How many Mujahideens are there? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot. There's a lot. But like uh, um, the thing is, you have to remember, you know, this is another thing that makes it hard for Americans to bring Afghanistan into focus is that. You know, we come from a culture and a country where we've taken a, a lot of pride in the fact that we're, we consider ourselves a melting pot. And, you know, to a large extent, that's true. But when you go to some places as old and, and uh, 
uh, as Afghanistan, with the history that Afghanistan has, the ethnic groups, your ethnic identity is probably more important than the fact that you're an Afghan. And, you know, the, the eastern and southern parts of Afghanistan are, the vast majority are, are Pashtun people, and they speak Pashtu. The northern regions are Tajik and Uzbek. And, uh, and then the central part, there's Hazara, who are Sharia. I mean, not Sharia. Uh, um, <laughs> Shia. Shia, yeah, yeah. And um, thanks. So there's, you know, these, these tensions that go on. And so uh, Mujadadi, I don't think, I think he's, I don't think, I don't know if he's Pashtu or not, but. He is. He is? He's a Sufi peer. Okay, all right. So, but anyway, these, you know, it, it's a complex situation. And um, that's why I'm, I'm, my fear is that once we leave, that it's going to quickly descend into a civil war and it's going to be ethnic based. And, um, and that's why I, I know there's, there's not a lot of public support for this. I said, but, you know, if, if we expect to be able to complete the job that we kind of set out to do there, uh, we're, we're going to have to insert ourselves and remain there for an extended period of time to preclude this. And I think, with, you know, without being there, it's, it's inevitable that it reverts. What is the chance? Yeah. <laughs> there is no chance. I don't know. I guess I pray a lot. <laughs> Yes. Is there any steam for a popular uprising of Afghanistan Spring or something, or is this power vacuum? Yeah, well, see, that's, that's another, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it relates to that. It doesn't, but if there's anyone who's going to push back, it would be the Afghan army. And someone else mentioned there's the 300,000 soldiers that have been trained. But then the other thing you have to realize is that the, who, who is in this army a lot of the soldiers have been have come from the northern tribes. They're not; it's not a, an integrated army. And once the U.S. withdraws, if you have significant numbers of the northern people in the south fighting the Taliban, and the U.S. support isn't there, they're going to withdraw. They're going to go back to where they feel comfortable. You know, they're not going to be out there fighting the Taliban, the Pashtu Taliban all by themselves. They're, I mean, it'll go on for a short time, but they're going to eventually get pushed out. I know, I know. I just, I really feel badly about, I always have these depressing scenarios in my books. <laughs> but I, on the other hand, I think, you know, we do have to be realistic, you know. And I, the other thing that irritates me is all of this happy talk and, I mean, I, I was watching a CBS, I mean, CBS of all things, and this, they're giving a report, like an update from Kabul, right? And so the correspondent is riding with the new commanding general in a helicopter, and they're not like strafing over the ground. They're way up, because you can see out the door. So, I mean, they're beyond anybody being able to shoot. And so you have this, you know, scratchy conversation where this general's talking about, we're, we're, we're making progress, we're making progress. Like, wait, what? 12 years and now you're making progress? What, what's been going on? And then, then the, the, the short clip cuts and she's standing there on a rooftop someplace in Kabul and says, yes, uh, we're very confident that things are happening. You know, things are moving forward. You know, and that's the report. I mean, there's no people, there's no shots on the ground, there's no, you know, shots of marketplaces, there's no, you know, the kind of stuff that you should do as a journalist, you know. That's my complaint. <laughs> yes? I came in late, so maybe you covered this. Initially, America went into Afghanistan in order to crush Al-Qaeda. Um, that's been done. As as I understand it, we're now spending $2 billion a week in Afghanistan 
and what exactly is America's beef with the Taliban since they didn't have anything to do with 9-11 and how long do you anticipate we will be there spending $2 billion a week? <laughs> I think you and a whole lot of other Americans are asking that same question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I mean, that leads me to a, I'll answer this in a kind of different way, but I, I think the problem was created in Afghanistan when, you know, I like the way Obama characterized it. He said, we took our eyes off the ball, and after Osama bin Laden slipped away, then all of a sudden, we're, you know, in 2003, we, we, we attack Iraq. And all of the resources that had been dedicated and directed toward Afghanistan were pulled away and into another war. And what happened is that there was this period of time, like you were there a number of years, like you saw this out decline. Because we withdrew and had this minimal force there, it allowed the Taliban to come back. And a lot of the civil programs that had been initiated kind of went on the back burner while we spent all of our time and money in Iraq. And this, this basically allowed the situation in Afghanistan to deteriorate. And that's what generated all of this antagonism that I encountered from the Afghan people. They said, you came here and things were going to be wonderful. Drove out the Taliban. And now, 12 years later, what? And I, I feel even though, you know, yeah, we did Al-Qaeda. Al we've been there for 12 years. We set up all these expectations with this country. And one, like I think we need to finish the job there. But two, um, you have to remember that what started this whole war on terror was the attacks of 9-11. And where were the attacks on 9-11 hatched? In Afghanistan. The Taliban had given sanctuary to Osama bin Laden and, uh, and Al-Qaeda. And that's where they set up the entire attack. So if we don't do something to secure in some small fashion that country, we risk repeating this history. Yeah. Um. It seems based on the conversation that we have today that you're asking for more than that. You're asking for like a kind of outrage and um, to use your words, a kind of um, anger from, from the American people, from the domestic front. And I was wondering um, how, how you see that sort of anger mobilizing or consolidating itself and actually communicating through to the American state, considering that were quite ineffective. Um, the left here today is quite effective at making like basic quality in its own country. So what, um, yeah, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, well, what, what I was, it, you know, what, what that alludes to or what I'm referring to is that I think uh, having been to Afghanistan and seen this it, and then, like I said, watching those CBS news reports, we're being lied to. You know, they're saying, well, you know, we're making progress and, you know, the Afghan forces are getting closer to being able to secure their country. And it's just, it's all a bunch of hooey. And um, I, I think, like I said, I come back to, you know, if we're going to be serious about this and not become, once again, make the worst possible diplomatic decision and walk away and leave this horrendous mess, um, that's what I think people should be outraged about. And it's just, yes. Um, I work with uh, the Afghan Women's Writing Project, which um, supports women to tell stories and, and write their stories. So I'm really grateful to you for what you did with your book, whether or not they're all typical Afghans or not. Um, but I, I would like to hear you talk um, about the role of NGOs and civil programs 
it seems to me that that is um, what is making a difference, but I don't know. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I, no, I agree. I mean, the program I was there with was, uh, we worked with <laughs> Afghan journalists in all, all parts of the country. And that's what allowed me to be able to, to go out into the countryside and talk to the people I talked to. Because, you know, these local guys in every community uh, know the lay of the land. They know the Taliban commanders. You know, we'd make the phone calls and get things set up so we're not doing something really dumb. And, uh, you know, driving into the middle of a firefight or something like that. Or, so, but yeah, I mean, that, you know, we've done a lot, you know, my organization, we've trained a lot of journalists. And that's, there's, um, they're courageous, courageous people because they face the kind of threats that American journalists have nightmares about. But they do that on a daily basis. And uh, like, like these writing projects like you're talking about and just other NGOs, there's a tremendous amount of work being done. But again... Um, it's, I, I feel like it's just the beginning. It, it could all just stop. You know, just basically like turning down the music, you know. Um, and I'm just afraid that all this good that's being done, it's not wasted, but it's going to stop. And what's, what's going to be left? What remains? What remains behind? And I, you know, I... I, I believe in this country, and I think if there's any hope, you know, it's, it's going to be from people like us, from this country. No, no other country has the capability or the strength or power to do what's necessary there. Russia's not going to do it. China's not going to do it. Pakistan, you know, and Iran certainly aren't going to rebuild. I mean, who's out there that has the capability? You know, we're the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And America needs to grow up and realize that. We are, if this is the American era. Nobody, nobody's even close. You know, and if we don't do it, you know. I'm very surprised that after 12 years, you still believe that we can do it. Without <laughs> understanding that we cannot do it. <laughs> who can do it, we have to empower them. Right. Who are the neighbors. Well, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm, I, I should be more clear about what I'm saying. Is we need to, you're right, we need to empower these people. I, I don't mean to imply that we do this in an imperial, heavy-handed manner. But what I'm saying is we can't, we shouldn't just withdraw and let it all collapse. Because we've got a lot of, lot of balls we're juggling in the air, so to speak. And if we don't, if we don't keep something going there, it's all going to implode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, two questions. So there's this book, uh, Poetry of the Taliban, which translates, presents, and seeks to humanize in a way the, the literature, the oral, mostly oral literature that, that circulates among the Taliban. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, to what, um, how do you think that this book is attempting to approach some of the same questions about about Taliban? Afghan stories about themselves that your own book is. And my second question is that, so it's, it's hard to condemn this, this uh, desire or sentiment out of defending your land from, from an outside of um, But it's also hard not to condemn a lot of the extreme uh, policies, governmental policies and demands that have been done. What, what extent do you think these two things influence each other? Like, how, how do you think that these that these extreme demands are a product, a product of the pressure that has been exerted on, uh, on Afghanistan since the Soviet times, since the current population. Um, well, the, um, uh, the, uh, the time I spent uh, in uh, southern Afghanistan, I, I did meet, uh, <laughs> you know, the Pashtuns have a really strong literary tradition, poetry, in essays, and um, one of my first meetings with uh, some uh, uh, some of the Pashtus there was these guys had their they were editors of their own little small monthly publications, and uh, we had a lot of fun. I you know sitting down and talking with them and going over their poetry and things like that and their literature, and uh, of course they were all looking for some money to support their program, but 
I, I was very impressed. And yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's easy to develop a, uh, the stereotypical idea of Pashtus as these radical Talibans. And they're all, you know, with the black turbans and the skulls on their faces and carrying AK-47s. That's, that's, not, that's not the people. <laughs> Um, but um, what are you suggesting? You're asking about like the, re the, the reaction that the war is a reaction to the history of invasions and that there. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, just a lot of the like, really really extreme attitudes, like, like, separate those and things. They're just like society. This is not, not the case. But I, I'm just wondering, like, do you think that that's that is a reaction to all that? Well, that's, I mean, you're bringing up a, another point that I, that I feel strongly about. I, I struggled a lot with, you know, the, the religion, you know, the religious feeling in Afghanistan is very, very strong. They're very, very religious people. And numerous times I was in the middle of doing something or an interview, literally. Somebody would get up, put their prayer rug down, and just, they just stop talking and then pray. And then they get up and we continue the interview. So... And this was, you know, you can wait. You know, you can wait for this interview. You know, you know, my relationship with God is more important here. So, um, uh, and so I, I thought long and hard about this, and I realized that I, I think one of the reasons Afghans cling so strongly to this very fundamentalist religion is that exactly what you're suggesting is that they've been through so many wars certainly for the last 30 years, it's pretty much been constant warfare. Um, and uh, yeah, at least 30 years, because the Soviets invaded in 79. So it's been 30 years. So um, the one thing, you know, like especially in the countryside, the people don't have the education, they don't have the electricity, they don't have internet, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing they have that gives them solidity and focus to their lives is their religion. And you can understand, you know, like people, you need certain structure in your life. And especially when you have the winds of war whirling around constantly. You know, when you wake up day after day, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether you're going to make it to the end of the day. But you have one thing that you can always count on, and it's this very strict religion. And I, I'm just absolutely convinced that's, that's the strength of it. And, then, and there's a good, you know, psychological reason for it. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Uh, The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.